Okay, welcome back. We are continuing on now with lighting, lighting and environment. So we have uh, looked at the different lighting nodes and we're about to tackle uh, the last of them, which is spotlight. Then we'll get into uh, the background nodes and fog. So here we are, spotlight. So what is a spotlight? It's a not a set of parallel rays. It's not a point that radiates in all directions, but it's a point that radiates within the confines of a cone or a spherical angle. So still all directions, but constrained down to that conical outline. Okay, so you can consider it pretty similar to point light in that respect, in that, well, it's just a point light that instead of being omnidirectional, is just focused about that cone. But everything within that cone is exactly the same as it might be for a point light. Okay, so uh, how big is that solid angle? Well, it's defined by the field called beam width. And as with other angles in X3D, that's in radians. Okay, and uh, we see that there's also a, a second angle that's used, and that's cutoff angle. And the combination of beam width and cutoff angle lets us have a bright center to the cone and then have the light gradually uh, drop off as, as we get farther away from that center line. So uh, let's look at some of these fields in a little more detail. As before, we have uh, the basic fields that they all share. Uh, our attenuation is, uh, again, the uh, how fast do we drop off uh, on those values. And the way to read this little equation here is that we have a maximum of either 1 in the denominator or this quadratic which takes the distance r squared the distance r is between the light and the object the object being lit and so you can see as R increases, the, the denominator also increases, but then the overall factor goes down. Okay, so let's express that here. As R increases, then our factor decreases. And that's regardless of uh, uh, how big your coefficients are if, if they're non-zero. If they're non-zero, then as R gets bigger, that denominator will always get bigger and the overall factor that controls attenuation will get smaller. Okay, uh, important note as before with point light that if you use uh, those non-uniform uh, values, if in other words, attenuation uh, subscript one or attenuation subscript two, then that could get computationally expensive as time goes on. Not so bad with the linear, but quadratic can be noticeable. Ordinarily, we wouldn't care about a, a, a computation like that at all, but since lights, each light affects every pixel drawn in the scene, then anytime we add a light, particularly anytime if we add an expensive light, we have to pay attention to that to make sure performance isn't dropping. Okay, other parameters are uh, pretty straightforward. Uh, location is where we put it. Again, it's dependent on the transformation hierarchy where you stick it in the scene. And notice this time, since it's not op omnidirectional, it's dependent both on the translation and on the rotation. Because obviously a cone of light can get rotated in different directions. We're no longer um, 
And finally, a uh, very helpful field, radius, lets us make sure that the light doesn't go too far, that we're not lighting things that we have no intention of affecting, but keep it scoped to the area of the scene where it matters. So uh, if we're using spotlights to light, say, uh, sometimes we call it museum X3D, where you're hanging pictures on the wall. Uh, sometimes spotlights are helpful to get an object, a picture or an object, a statue, whatever it is, uh, properly lit. Then radius is a good way to make sure that that light is for just there and not going on and on and illuminating things elsewhere in the scene. Okay, what other uh, fields? Well, we mentioned them. Uh, beam width and cutoff angle are uh, how we define the characteristics of that cone. And basically it works where at the inner part of the cone we have full intensity. As we get outside that uh, inner spherical angle, the intensity drops off linear linearly from uh, full intensity to zero. So there's multiple effects that can reduce the intensity of light depending on its distance from the light source and also whether it's inside the cutoff angle or outside the cutoff angle or outside the beam width where there's no intensity. Okay, then finally, similar to before, our direction vector. Again, we, we go to an XYZ pointing vector rather than an SF rotation. Uh, now because uh, beam width and cutoff angle are so important, we have to make sure that they have the right relationship to each other. And here we go. So uh, the, the correct way to look at this is beam width is the smaller of the two and the cutoff angle is the larger. And so we do see that relationship preserved here, where beam width must be less than cutoff angle, and altogether they must be less than pi over 2 radians, which I'm sure you're uh, expert at now. Say, well, 2 pi is 360 degrees, pi is 180 degrees, therefore pi over 2 is 90 degrees. Think about a spotlight having a cutoff angle, the outer thing of 90 degrees, then, oh, okay, that's half, fully half of uh, where it can shine out. It'd be an interesting uh, cone right there. Okay, and so here we've attempted to illustrate in this figure that the uh, intensity varies in two different ways. The intensity varies, uh, it goes down as, as we uh, get farther from the source. So if we say this arrow uh, equals increasing intensity, excuse me, decreasing intensity going from 1 to 0, then I'll draw some blue arrows here to, uh, to illustrate. So we have intensity decreasing as we go away from the source. We also have intensity decreasing, well, let's get precise here, uh, not in the center part, but in the outer part, outside the beam width, is where our intensity decreases with range. Okay, so within that inner beam width, we have uh, only one effect for reducing intensity, and that's the range, <coughs> how far we get. Outside that inner beam width, between beam width and cutoff angle, we see there's two effects that will decrease intensity. So, th so this can be very nice. You can get very gradual, very realistic looking lighting effects with your spotlights. It can be also be interesting if you're animating that, if the light itself is moving, uh, headlights on a car or something like that. So, um, pretty cool. What else can we say? And then, of course, uh, the range is the final cutoff, 
where nothing will go past that. Okay, so here's our scene. Let's uh, do a quick check on the fields. It looks like we have everything we're looking for here. There's our beam width. There's our cutoff angle. Uh, uh, Chris, are you scrying again today? Yep. Could you please, why don't we make a note there? It probably makes more sense to put beam width right next to cutoff angle. Just a, a fine tuning tweak to the interface. Uh, not strictly alphabetical, but put the related parameters right next to each other. And you can see the uh, attenuation array has uh, three coefficients to it uh, for the constant, the linear, and the quadratic terms. And what's the right value to use in each of those? Well, uh, let your eyes be your guide. It's best to just simply experiment with it. Uh, I'm not familiar with any high-end tools that let you give you much of a uh, way to check that. It might be interesting if somebody wrote a little uh, prototype, a little animation chain, you could conceivably build a, a widget to adjust that inside the scene and help you uh, uh, see the effects as you go. Okay. And then we have a second example to look at here as well. So let's bring her up. So I'm watching, uh, getting our XJ3D viewer restarted. And we can see it here. Make this guy a little bigger. Okay, so here we again have, uh, looks like a flat polygon, but we know from our prior example that this is likely a mesh, so I'll shift to wireframe, Alt-Shift-W, and sure enough, it is a, a mesh of much smaller triangles so that we can see the individual effects of the the spotlight as we uh, as we move around. Okay, so you can see there is a, a nice finely grained drop off. We can also see if we zoom in to the corner that uh, sure enough there are some jaggies here corresponding to uh, how big the grid size is. Etc. So, uh, if you have, uh, if you don't want those kinds of jaggies in your scene, then that would be telling you you haven't gone to a fine enough tessellation to get the fully smooth effect that you want. And if you could, could you increase the size of the um, the geometry that's, that that light's being projected on, so you can actually see the full circle? Uh, could we? Sure. Uh, let's do that. The question is, can we increase the size of the geometry to see the full circle? So the best way to do that it would be to scale it. And let's make sure our light is outside. Shouldn't get affected by scale. Well, actually, I hesitate to say that. The scale would change a translation. Uh, but we don't have to worry about it in this case. So how much bigger would you like to make it, Ken? Uh, Twice. Two, okay. Two should probably. Yeah, I think, yeah, XJ3D10, which we're still using, has a bug in that the lights don't seem to update. It'll be nice when that 2.0 comes out. So I'll launch it in an external browser. Oh, 
I guess I'll also launch it in uh, XJ3D as well and we'll compare the two. It's smooth on the on the two sides. And well, I'd say that's an artifact of the uh, tessellation. Uh, so and and you might you might think that oh hey wait a minute I I made it bigger so we should get finer tuning but really that made the triangles bigger in here and so um, here we go that just exaggerated the effect. So if you want a finer detail, you have to make the triangles, triangles relatively smaller. What if we made X's in the triangles? Would that actually change that? I don't think so. Uh, and part of this might simply be the uh, browser. In fact, let's, let's try a trick here. Uh, let's try changing the anti-aliasing and see if that helps. Well, that didn't help, did it? Okay, well, I think we've pushed uh, XJ3D beyond its limits. Let's see how our other browser looks. You can see we're getting a similar effect here, but not quite the same. So how a browser does it, there is still some variation internally on the fine-tuning of these effects. Let's look at our uh, wireframe here. Okay, so that's consistent, as we would hope. The, uh, can, can we blend the two spotlights too, or um, you, like you, instead of a yellow one there? Or? Oh, sure. You could use more than one light and have them overlap and things like that. So uh, I'm not seeing many other switches here. This is within uh, instant reality. But you get the idea. So if you want to fine tune that kind of thing, uh, uh, you can. Ordinarily, those those little jaggies and sharp edges we're seeing would probably not be noticed at all, uh, given that you have some kind of complex geometry. When you can intentionally put flat polygons straight against it, that's going to highlight any of those artifacts. So, so the mileage varies depending on what you're working with. Check out the interface, and sure enough, looks uh, looks like it's all there. Okay, so let's check out our second example now. And here we have a slightly different example. Instead of Spotlight.x3D, it's called Spotlight Color, and We've got a consistent set of geometry, but what we're doing here is taking a color interpolator and driving that against the spotlight color and seeing how does that change the, uh, the visible scene. So let's check. Okay, now this uh, animation we have here, there's our color interpolator, there's our route, there's our time sensor. So if we look at our time sensor in this guy, we see that, okay, not only is it enabled, but loop is on, and it's got an eight second cycle. So that means we should expect this thing to just keep going and going and going. We don't need a trigger node to kick it off. And in fact, when we look over at this guy, we are seeing it very continuously, very continuously without any intervention by me. If we further examine our colors here, then we see, okay, this is pretty interesting. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven 
different keys, seven different colors, and uh, why so many? Well, let's check it out. We go, this might seem uh, totally obvious, but it can be tricky. So we go yellow to yellow. What does that mean? Oh, that means it was constant. It didn't change for that portion of the uh, uh, cycle. And further, when we got to the very end, we end with yellow. And we do that so that when it repeats from the end key to the beginning key, because loop is true, the time sensor is just flipping and repeating, there's no obvious jump, there's no discontinuity in the lighting, but it just looks very gradual and cyclic. So we have three yellows that are essentially contiguous in time. They are side by side. The end wraps around at the beginning. And then we have four uh, whites. Why do we have the white color? Well, uh, so we can see it, see what its natural color is. And we have that big block in there so that uh, we know it's constant all the time. Now, still one little idiosyncrasy here. We could say, well, did we really need so many whites? I mean, wouldn't it be enough to have two and just get rid of that one and that one? Answer, yes, we could have. This is a, an authoring style here. I chose to put uh, even increments in there just so we could see how it worked and see that the white was relatively longer than the gray. So let's look now down at this down at this screen and see what it's doing. We see it's yellow for a short time and uh, then it'll go to white. How short a time? Well, our, our keys are obviously one-eighth. Okay, one-eighth of eight seconds loop means each of these guys <coughs> is one second long. Okay, and we're not seeing the, the pulsation now because uh, the screen locks when I'm drawing on it, so let's Clear the screen and watch this and see if the timing matches. Okay, that's clearly white. I say clearly because uh, we're looking at the background. Let's open this up a little bit to confirm that. Try again here. zoom out and sure enough we can see once I zoom out there is there we go there is our original grid so if we had just used the background of the scene we wouldn't have seen the lighting change at all we had to put some geometry behind it so that we could see what the basic light color was here and if you pay attention to the timing of this and count it with your watch, you should see that uh, five eighths of the time it's mostly white. Say three seconds of that it's steady white. And then uh, the other three eighths of the time it's transitioning through yellow, which means one second of that it's constant. Okay. Could we get more sophisticated with how it changes? Sure. Do whatever you want with the color interpolator might be fun to play with. What's particularly interesting though is uh, something that's dead obvious but I haven't even mentioned yet and that is the colors change. The perceived colors change. Why? Because the baseline colors look to be blue and purple here but then we perceive them as green and red when we're shining a yellow light on them. So let's confirm that the baseline colors are blue and purple. Okay, to do that, we go to the uh, materials in here, 
Okay, so there was our white rectangular backdrop. So uh, that did not change. It's not animated. Then purple cone. Okay, there's our purple value right there, 0 0.801. And here's our not so much blue as it is turquoise. Pull that guy up. And there it is. 0 0.81. Okay, so there you have it. A, an examination of not only how the light looks and what effects it has, but how light color changes, how your objects are perceived, and the fact that although lights are expensive, you have to be a little careful with them, they're certainly animatable. And you can change the color of your light. Uh, Make a light show in your scene if you want. Okay. And if you look at the notes for this page, uh, it helps document it. So you don't have to go through all the step by step that I did if you don't want to. But this does give you a cue to um, back out and the color of objects can definitely appear quite differently depending on the light. Okay, one more example that's uh, pretty interesting here. I tossed this in as an extra. I got this out of the basic examples archive under the development subdirectory. And this was a, a cool example that was posted on the mailing list, uh, gosh, back in 2003 by uh, Miriam English, uh, a very skilled author who's posted a lot of cool things over the years. Thank you, Miriam for posting this and let's let's take a look at it. It's called Additive Subtractive Light and, and the description here tells you what we're what she's trying to show here is that uh, there's a concept of uh, negative colors and filtering that's sometimes used in other graphics models as an advanced effect and that's not directly supported in X3D so we simply show uh, how things look together or subtracted and some of it works and some of it is beyond the design of x 3 and so it doesn't work. Um, it doesn't work as hoped for. Um, but uh, negative results have value so that's why we show it. So here we go, additive subtractive light. There's also a PNG file in there you're having some trouble with your browser, there's a screen snapshot so you can see what the uh, final result might look like. Let's bring it up live. And so here we go here. What's see. the X3D file on that, Doc? This is in the uh, basic example spread, additive, subtractive, light. And in the slide itself, if you go to the notes for this example, you can see, uh, which I'm doing on the screen right now, you can see not only the uh, page links to where that is, uh, where that can be found online, but you can also find a little description and a copy of that uh, PNG image. Okay. So I'm going to switch back to X3D Edit to show this guy, and it's helpful to uh, that didn't work. Try it this way. If I tilt this in navigation mode and look at it. Uh, from the side, you can see that portions of this scene are 3D and other portions are uh, just an image. Uh, 
actually, uh, I guess they're all 3D, but the diffuse is, is faked and it just doesn't work uh, in each case. So, um, before we saw with the cone and, this, and the cylinder together with the the light color changing from yellow to white, we saw that the perceived color changes. Well, uh, here we have three balls that are coincident with three spotlights on the left, and we can see that we're able to uh, uh, get a little closer to those, and you can see the effects of blending of the light purple, bluish green, there's even some yellow in there where the, uh, where the green is hitting the red. Okay, so a fun example to experiment with things and uh, look at uh, some ways you can do it and some ways it just won't really work. Uh, so have fun with that one. Okay, back to the slides. And that covers us for Spotlight. So now let's move on to the uh, other part of this chapter, and those are the nodes uh, that deal with the environment and uh, how we draw the environment. Uh, shall we take a short break? Before we go into that? Okay, great. We'll be right back. Okay, welcome back. Hope everybody has their uh, caffeine looking around. Yeah, I guess, guess you guys are ready. We're going to finish up on the uh, lighting environment nodes, and as promised, we're finally there. We're uh, uh, going to go over the concepts and the nodes relative to environment, and specifically, that means uh, we're going to look at the background node type, and then we have three nodes to consider here. Uh, background what's around the scene, texture background, very similar node, and then finally fog, how we put uh, fog effects in the middle of the scene. Okay, so concepts. So, um, I didn't just make up uh, this term environmental effects, this is the name of the component in X3D uh, where these nodes are defined together since they have some similar attributes, similar capabilities. So the background node uh, has two ways of defining it, but basically is giving uh, the background of anything that's in the scene. If you're uh, looking at me now on video, you're probably seeing me just with my back to uh, black screen on, on space. And, in actuality, I'm sitting in front of a, a green screen, so that's my background here. And if I was sitting in a 3D environment, that background would be something I could never quite touch, but it would always be just out of reach at the horizon and provide that background, that backdrop to uh, the activity in the scene. So uh, that can be very helpful for filling in the blanks and for giving a sense of place, giving a sense of presence in, at a given location. Okay, uh, Texture background and background nodes are almost identical in their functionality. Uh, the difference is in their structure in that background can have either a color array, which we'll look at, you know, colors range from the top to the bottom, uh, or you can put images behind it. In uh, the background node, which is the plastic node from Hermal that we've kept all the way through X3D, there's specific URL values that are given and it's just a set of six uh, fields, six attributes. In a texture background we say, well sometimes we want to reuse those images and it would just be more convenient if we had them in an image texture node by themselves. So in, in texture background uses those image textures as child nodes.
Okay. Then what do we have? We have fog. Fog node is uh, yet another node, and what it does is it doesn't spray fog through a scene, but rather says the farther you get from the camera, from the user's current viewpoint, the more the fog would obscure what you're seeing. How do we do that? We simply wash out the color in the scene a bit more as, as distance gets greater. So the farther something is, the more washed out it will look. And the fog node gives us control then over uh, that wash out effect. Okay, so uh, why are these called environmental? Well, because there's, they're not something direct that you could touch or interact with. They're, they're just part of the ambiance of the scene to uh, help set an environment, help set the stage for the activity that you have going on. Okay, let's see here. All right, there we go. So now we have a node type. Uh, you should recall that node types are our formal way of collecting together common functionality to make sure that similar nodes which are part of the same node type will have identical signatures for the pieces that matter that were defined in that node type. This is how we guarantee internal consistency between our nodes that are quite similar so we don't get little edge cases or, or curious defects in how they're defined or implemented. Okay, so uh, there are two background nodes currently defined in X3D. Uh, First is background, the second is texture background. Uh, interestingly though, uh, they do more than share a similar name and similar functionality. They also share uh, the same binding stack, meaning just as viewpoints, you can only have one at a time and uh, with navigation info nodes, you can only have one of those at a time active. And uh, back in our chapter on viewing and navigation, we went over the binding stack operations in some detail. Well, in this case, background, it only makes sense to have one backdrop, one set of colors at the horizon at any given time. So it would not make sense to have more than one background at a given moment. Similarly, it would not make sense to have a background and a texture background at the same time because effectively they're doing the same thing. So this is why those two nodes, background and texture background, are on the same binding stack. It means only one of any of those can be active at a given time. We'll see that fog node does the same thing. We can't have one kind of fog here and another kind of fog there, at least the way the uh, fog node is defined. Um, future work, we're not covering it in the book, but as a point of information, someday we'll uh, look at uh, local fog, which is a new node. I think we put that in in uh, uh, version 3.2. But local fog lets us uh, have a similar the fog effects, but constrain where it occurs. So in that case, you could have more than one local fog available. But we're not going to dwell on that. We're going to just say today we're going to deal with the uh, baseline nodes that are covered in the book. Okay. All right. So what else can we say about this thing? Um, the words make sense after you've seen it. They're maybe a little confusing. Uh, uh, until you do, but the basic idea is that we're either putting a gradual color from the zenith high above down to the horizon, down to the nadir far below, and using a gradual color map to be our background, or we're putting images up there that have been carefully scaled and warped, hopefully, to match uh, what they would look like in the real world. Okay. And it's very important that you can't reach out and touch those things. You can navigate in the scene, but you could almost think of it as, uh, well, sort of like uh, 
a donkey with a carrot on a stick. No matter how far the donkey goes, the carrot's always right out there far ahead and you can't quite reach it. Well, it's the same thing here. No matter where the user's viewpoint goes, that sphere, which encompasses the background, stays just out of reach and keeps going uh, behind whatever objects are in the scene so that you can never get uh, up close to that. Now as a result, since you can't get any closer to that, if you put a transform node or multiple transform nodes above a background, then it doesn't matter. Because if it's already, already at a distance of just out of reach, then what's just out of reach plus 10 meters? Uh, it's still just out of reach. So the translations don't matter. However, the rotations can take effect on that. So that would be a pretty wacky effect, probably pretty disorienting, but uh, it's possible. I haven't seen anybody actually use that, but no doubt somebody will feel challenged one of these days. And, I uh, want to get there from here. Okay. Okay, so here's a diagram. And uh, this diagram shows two different views. So we have the side view on the left, and we have the top view on the right. So let's just focus for the moment on the left side view. Okay, so we're looking at the side of an eyeball. Y is up. And uh, X happens to be the direction we're looking at here. And so we can think of two things surrounding, just out of reach, surrounding that user's camera. Uh, outermost, what we have is a sphere that would hold the color array from top to bottom, from the top of the sky down to the uh, nadir, the, the bottom of the graph. Uh, also just out of reach, but just inside that sphere would be, would be a box. The, uh, Tiff, you want to put the sign up, please? Thanks. Okay, so uh, if we have that sphere of colors that's just out of reach, we also have a box that's just out of reach, but just inside the sphere. And the box is where six images could be laid down. Left, right, front, back, top, bottom, and uh, uh, also provide that backdrop. So it might be photographic that's warped, it might be a painting or something drawn that somebody has carefully made to put images in there. That's the, uh, the notion on the left. If we rotate that around and look at, uh, on the right, then we're, uh, we're at a top-down view now. So I guess I could draw, uh, if we were going to do uh, uh, eyebrows, uh, on the left the eyebrow would be there. On the top, the eyebrows would be there over the eyeball. So we're looking down onto that. So our viewpoint on the right is we're on the y-axis looking down towards the center. And uh, you can see where the plus x and plus z axes are. And then this tells you where's left, right, front, back. Okay. Uh, you can also see that uh, our circles remain concentric. In fact, there were two spheres. The sky sphere goes uh, 360 degrees. So it's a full sphere, whereas the uh, round sphere is only 180 degrees, it's a, uh, it's a hemisphere. Okay, so on the left, once again, we're on a side view of the hemisphere. On the top, 
looking down then that ground sphere is sort of like we're looking into a bowl which is what you would imagine here for how that looks and uh, the sky sphere is a full full sphere not a hemisphere and all around okay so hopefully those pictures help uh, let's look at the uh, fields that belong to either the background nodes, background or texture background. Well, ground angle and sky angle are rays, and they uh, correspond to ground color and sky color arrays. All right, so we have a one-to-one uh, -one correspondence here between the element of each array. draw it like that. Okay, so we'll see that there's pairwise definitions for each color corresponding to each angle on that sky sphere or on that ground hemisphere. Okay, and although we just define a handful of colors typically, we will get a smooth effect of how the color changes because it's linearly interpolated from one color to the other, average changes from one color to the other in a smooth way, so we can get some interesting effects. Okay, some key terms here to uh, pay attention to. Uh, when we're talking about straight up, we're talking about zenith. The zenith is straight up. When we're talking about straight down, we're talking about nadir. The nadir is pointing downwards and uh, would be considered directly below the user's viewpoint, just as the uh, zenith is directly above the user's viewpoint. Okay. Uh, as before, the uh, angles are all in radians, so that's why when we put our values in, we'll have to go to 0 to pi over 2, which, of course, is 90 degrees. And uh, the sky color can go all the way down to pi values or pi value of 180 degrees, going all the way from zenith to horizon is 90, and then horizon down to nadir would be a full 180. Okay, so what's next on this guy? Uh, there we go. Uh, since the angles uh, are actually not where the color is, but where we transition between uh, the color. Uh, uh, no, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm misstating that. Since the first color in the array, if it's a sky color, it's the zenith. The first color, the ground color, is the nadir. We already know what the value is for those. It's at a zero degree angle for each before they start. So we don't have to define that first angle corresponding to the first color. And that's why our array length is one less. Okay, but with each color we add after the first one, we would have to add uh, another angle value. Okay. Another constraint on this is since we want our color array to go from one end to the other and to make sense and to be linear inter linearly interpolated from one value to the other, you can't jumble them around. You have to put them in order. So your sky angle values must proceed smoothly from zenith down to horizon. They've got to be call that monotonically increasing. They can never get less on each one. And then if you keep going past horizon down to nadir, your sky angle values again must be monotonically increasing or getting steadily larger. The opposite holds true for ground angle values as you go up from the nadir to the horizon. And since ground is ground, uh, we never let ground go above the horizon. Okay. Uh, 
Now, the last constraint is pretty helpful too. Uh, sometimes you don't want ground. Sometimes you don't want gradual colors on the sky. Sometimes you just want a single color. You'd like to just change the background color that's in there. Okay, fine. The way to do that is to put in a single sky color value. And since the sky color will wrap all the way to the bottom from its last one, if there's no ground plane to supersede it, then you, in effect you get uh, full coverage by that. So uh, a single sky color and nothing else, no angle values, no additional color values for sky, no ground angle or ground color values. That implies that that single color is a single background color. So that's our simplest combination out of all these constraints. I well, couldn't get much simpler than that, a single, uh, single value. Okay, so now let's go into the nodes themselves and we'll see these examples and hopefully going to make the diagrams and descriptions even more sensible. Uh, so uh, once again we're redefining the node here. It does uh, match the X3D background node type, so we have the concepts already defined. The simple color images are what it holds, and we gradually change them one to the next. Now the images themselves, if we use images rather than a color array, then uh, the images get mapped to a box, not to a sphere, but to a box, so that they're flat. <coughs> that means those images would have to be carefully constructed so that the seams of where they come together at the corner of the box would hopefully not be visible to the user, but would just look like a continuous panorama as you go across. So you, there are no strict requirements for imagery, how many you have typically uh, you would have at least four for what's your panorama at the horizon. And usually that's enough because people aren't tending to look down at their feet in a virtual environment, nor do they tend to look up at the sky very much. So often you can get away with just using the color array to get a consistent sky that blends in with the top of the image and the bottom of the image. And since they're high above and not inside the user's regular field of view, don't even see it. Okay, so there you go. And another nice feature here is, uh, let's say you wanted to put some mountains in the distance, but have a sky color change. You could make the for time of day effects, or for weather, or for what have you. Then you could make the uh, uh, you could edit your image of the mountains to just make transparent pixels for wherever the sky was above the mountains and let your background color then shine through. And that can, if done carefully, can be a, a useful effect sometimes. Okay, uh, specifically, what do we have in these uh, background fields? We have uh, six, ar six arrays then for the URLs. You see them listed there, top, bottom, left, right, front, and back URL. Okay, and like all of our other URLs that we've seen before, an anchor, an image texture, an inline, it's an array of values. So you can have a more reliable way to get your images. It can be a local address or an online address. Then we also have uh, some other fields, because they're bindable, they have their own unique binding stack. If you want to switch out backgrounds, the way you would do that is you would give it a set bind. Set bind tells it to uh, become bound if you send it a true value. Um, if you send set bind a false value, then that will unbind that particular node. And then uh, if those are your inputs, then is bound is your output. If you want to keep track of what's going on with each background node, then uh, you can write your is bound field to your logic to say, well, if I switch backgrounds, then I further want to do this. This is how we construct our animation chains. 
Another helpful uh, output node is bind time. It might be that instead of using the Boolean for whether we're bound, true or false, you might want to just simply use the time as a different type of trigger for a different animation chain. So um, this is actually all totally consistent with the other bindable nodes that we learned about in the viewing chapter. So uh, the logic of how we switch viewpoints, how we switch navigation info nodes, how we switch these backgrounds, and how we switch fog is completely consistent. Okay, now we do provide a number of background nodes that use uh, some panoramas and they have crafted some carefully uh, uh, designed images so that you have a seamless background panorama. Some of them are pretty cool, so I recommend you look at those. In fact, uh, let's do that now. I'll launch them and uh, here's the directory uh, online and we can look at what are the different images that have been presented here. Okay, a little bit dark. Let's uh, open this up. And if I drive around the scene, I'm navigating to the right now. You can see this is uh, sort of a dark red background and a purplish sky. And we can look all around uh, when we rotate sideways. We can go back the other way. If I try to go forward, if I try to go backwards, there's no evident change in the distance of these images. Why? Because the background box is staying at a fixed distance from the user. You can't get any closer to it. It will always be behind whatever other objects might be drawn. In this scene, there are no other objects drawn. We're just looking at that. If we tried to change our navigation from walk mode forwards backwards to examine to change what direction we're looking at. Now let's go up and we can say, oh, okay, we can see more of the sky. Sure enough, there is sky. Uh, gee, you think it's going to rain tonight? Oh, and let's look down at our feet here. Pretty dark, this particular background, but we can look down at our feet. Now, uh, and this guy, I don't think he's giving us any choices on whether we're going to see anything else. Let's see if there are any other options we can take hold. Rendering. I'm looking for the wireframe, which would probably make everything go away. With some tools in wireframe mode, you can actually see the box that the images get mapped to. So they're not giving, giving us any tricks like that. Okay, let's go to, oh, that's not good. I guess uh, Octavia doesn't like, have, like to have two. <coughs> we'll uh, relaunch it. Before we do, let's just note that uh, this was a kind of interesting thing that the Universal Media folks did way back in the day. They had a call for assets and uh, they had a bunch of donations. People put their panoramas, their images into open source. So we we put them in the, the X3D basic archive. And they also got different people to agree to host them at different locations uh, to increase the reliability that people could just find those images elsewhere. The concern at that point was boy, the images could be a lot of bandwidth. We don't have much bandwidth. People are using modems and other things. How do we reduce that? So that was the idea. Is that really necessary anymore? Probably not. But it, it's a good idea, and it could be repeated if you want to cache multiple things. So let's try, uh, try this guy again. Yes, question. I was just wondering, has uh, Dr. Yu used any of these backgrounds with any of the X, like the X3D Earth downloads? I don't, I don't know if that, there's uh, an application. There. Not to my knowledge. I don't think so, no. Do you think it could be uh, done? Or? Could you use it? Well, you would want a space one. Let's, let's look at this guy. You can see it's some kind of sandy uh, mountains and the desert. Uh, what's Desert 3 look like? 
because your three is darker. We have some uh, forest simulations. This one's kind of pretty. But this is a good example of... Uh, Return of the Jedi. Pardon? Return of the Jedi scene. Jedi? Oh, yeah. Yeah. That scene with yeah. the top photos? Not top photos. Mm -hmm. the skimmers? I think somebody just uh, took this scene themselves and shot it. Maybe it's from somewhere that I don't recognize. But notice how they, they took a 360 picture. We can't look up. <laughs> Pretty cool. We can look down. Again, pretty cool. It's a little bit misleading visually because uh, most of the trees are distant here, so it would be good. But there is this one plant, what's that, an iris? Some kind of flower here. Uh, it's so close it makes you want to reach out and touch it. Another thing you can't do here is uh, if we try to walk, we're not walking anywhere. If we, we can walk in a circle, but you would intentionally want to set this scene up if with this kind of photograph, since it's not far away, but it's very up close and personal. I mean, we've got grass under our feet here. The context of your scene would be that the user is not allowed to do anything except stand in one place and not move. And uh, this is reminiscent of QuickTime VR and some other photography-based immersive environments that they will take pictures but if you notice you can only be at the location of the picture when they work. There's some more advanced techniques that are uh, becoming available now where people are using video to move from place to place so you do get a sense, a sense of motion but even with that motion and the ability to go from one place to another the ability to look all around you're still restricted to the track where the photo was taken from because it always stays at that distance from the user. Okay, another for us even, uh, you know, well if you feel a need to lay down the flowers today, you've got a place to go now. another close one. So part of my takeaway is this is not a good technique. Forests are not a good technique for these kinds of images <coughs> too cluttered and too close. But if we get back to yours, uh, Chris, what would we do in space? Well, we've got, a, we've got a number here for the horizons, for mountains, and then space. Well, if we wanted to use the Earth as a, a backdrop for the Earth itself, an extra Earth model, then I think we would have to consider maybe a space motif. Let's take a closer look at this guy. Okay, I'm rotating around now. And you can see, yeah, this is called space, but it really is maybe closer to stratosphere or something like that, where we're high above the surface of the Earth. There's definitely a, a horizon effect here. Oh, and even a moon. The next one is another uh, uh, sort of atmospheric. Okay, those are either uh, Christmas ornaments falling uh, from overhead or, or uh, we're on a faraway planet with three moons that, uh, four moons maybe, uh, five or six moons uh, that come incredibly close to the surface. I know it's hard to try to contain your excitement. Right. <laughs> uh, uh, here's another one where they are interested in uh, flying globes. So what do you want for nothing? <laughs> this is what you got. This is what's in there. But it gives you a sense of what's possible. I haven't seen anybody do a star map in X3D, although I've seen one or two candidates that we might make into a uh, uh, X3D model. So there's plenty of uh, 
examples here if you want to play. You might find some of these useful or seen. Uh, don't be surprised if people think they're familiar. Okay, uh, next up. So here's our example scene, and we have a background node, and you can see back URL has multiple values, and there's a bunch of other stuff in here. So let's go find that scene. Background, Kelp Forest, Maine. And uh, you can see that it loaded pretty quickly. Uh, if we edit that node, you can now see that we have a color array. Up top, we can see that there's three sky angle colors and three uh, ground colors. X3D Edit will prompt you with the uh, uh, zenith. You don't have to fill that in in the nadir. Remember that the outer elements of the array are, are not uh, required. If we uh, look at how these laid out, you can see that it does go from uh, zenith down to nadir, top to bottom. So these color arrays are in order of how they would appear uh, on the background of the scene. Of course, we also have in this particular scene six images. So we only saw the colors right at the very beginning before the images got loaded. So if you uh, know what the color of your images are, whether they have transparency or not, you might want to use the background colors just as to fill in the blanks until the images arrive. If you have weather effects, uh, that you're trying to get from a weather server, then uh, you might want that so that there's at least some sense of context in the background of your scene while the user begins navigating and doing things. And then as the data eventually arrives, uh, it fills in more fully. If we uh, turn that off and we see that the uh, scene has been, I hope, gradually loading here in the background, if we go my x 3 d edit is unhappy. Okay, if we go back in and try to edit this guy again. All right, so now I'm going to select one of the uh, image URL editors. See, okay, there we go. Uh, it's one of our URL editors that we had before, and it's also color coded. It's uh, black if it's searching, it's green if it found it, and it's red if it got a not found error. So we can tell just by inspecting this that uh, three of the URLs are no longer active. Uh, some of the folks have moved their stuff. Okay. And I, with that, I think you have it. We have our arrays with the angle value array here and the colors over here. You can also define those colors uh, uh, manually in there, for better or worse. Okay, um, that's that. The next screen is simply giving you that close up of that, showing that when you click the um, click this triple button, you get the uh, URL editor. Sky colors are going top to bottom, and the ground color values are going bottom to horizon to eye level. Okay. And there are hints for this node. And it includes the warning 
the uh, you've got to have more than one uh, sky color, then you have sky angle. Similarly, you've got to have more than one ground color, then you have ground angle. Why? Because the first angle value isn't needed. We know it's always at the top or always at the bottom. And then uh, it looks like we have a bad warning here. So uh, Chris, please add that to the notes that the warning about colors at sky angle zero are ignored. That's, that's misinformed. And we should just get rid of that. Okay, now if we keep looking, we see, oh my gosh, there are lots of hints for background node. Why? Because each of the URLs get their own set of hints, but they're all identical. Uh, and most of that is the typical hints and warnings about construction of URL values. So, yes, those are all good things to know and pay attention to, but we've made it a lot more painless now on the syntax, at least if you use X3D edit, that you don't have to worry so much. Finally, we see at the bottom are our, our binding events, which is how we would uh, either turn on, turn off, or monitor the binding of each uh, background. Okay, so what's next? If that was background, well, good news. Uh, texture background is almost identical. And it's uh, ex extremely uh, similar in its layout and identical in its functionality. So we could have the same ground color, sky color, ground angle, and sky angle arrays. Once again, we have the same binding stack for texture background and background nodes. But this time, instead of using the URL arrays directly inside a back or single background node, we would have a, a single background node, excuse me, a single texture background node with up to six different uh, image textures as children. Okay? Uh, that way, if you're using, uh, say, the same images multiple times in multiple background nodes, maybe some are the same, some aren't, or if you wanted to reuse them, for very large images, they would each have to be loaded independently uh, by each URL because the browser can't tell. The browser's not allowed to say, well, you gave me the same address, I can just reuse the same value. No, I'm sorry. The, the, address might change over the time, over time. It might be a, if it were a weather server, the image could be quite different. So that's why we can't just reuse the same URLs. We would have to def and use a node to get the reuse that might be desired here. So this is why we added texture background. Image texture nodes is the children let us def and use them as a way to optimize, reduce, uh, the uh, space consumed at runtime by how many times an image was loaded. This would let us just load it once if we knew it was going to be the same. Finally, we mentioned here for completeness that you have transparency as another field. This is exactly the same as background, so once again, the functionality is identical. Right? So now, how do we tell uh, the difference? Between between these two, and this is this is sort of reminiscent of the story. What's the uh, what's the greatest invention of the history of the world? That joke I, I told so horribly, and, and Jeff, you I think you insisted upon keeping that on camera, didn't you? Uh, yeah, I completely botched that. I'll give I'll give you the short version where you had, you had the three three guys talking around the campfire, and the first one said that well, the greatest invention was fire because it brought mankind out of the darkness, let us cook our food, it gave us light, warmth in the winter. Oh, yeah, everybody goes, yeah, fire, fire, pretty good. Next per person said, the wheel, machinery, motion, the whole industrial revolution. Yeah, the wheel's pretty good. Remember, remember what number three was? 
Uh, yeah, the thermospot, right. because keeps hot things hot, cold things cold, and that sounds un unremarkable until you you ask, how does it know? Okay, well here we are again, texture background and texture. How, if texture background has six image texture children. How does it know which is which? How does it know which is left, right, front, back, top, bottom? Before we had special names for it, but now we just have image texture now. Okay, so the answer to that is syntax. How do we say it? How do we express which one is there? Uh, when we do a texture background node, if it's in uh, XML syntax, meaning the dot X3D, then the way we do that is we put in container fields. So let's see if I can get my handy dandy uh, highlighter going here. Okay, so container field equals left texture. Container field equals right texture. We probably should have laid out this table to be a little more readable. Oh, we missed a bet there. In any case, I hope you can read it. That's how we tell. That's how we distinguish um, the six different Im images. <coughs> so it doesn't matter what order they're in. They could be in any order. You don't have to count. Oh, the first one is front and the second one is back. No, no, that's not how it works. It's, you label it with a container field. <coughs> If you're using uh, classic formal syntax, dot x3d, the good old uh, squiggly and square brackets, then the way we do that is with field name. So here's the field name. Again, the same six names, and there is a uh, one-to-one -one correspondence between these guys. Okay, so there's left texture right there, here. Here's uh, right texture. Here's front texture. Here's back texture. Here's top texture. And here's bottom texture. Okay, so the same syntax. Or same terms, different syntax. Okay, hope that's clear. Here we go, here's our, our next example. And this one's called Texture Background, Kelp Forest, Maine. And we can see that sure enough, we've got our ground angle, ground color, sky angle, sky color arrays, and this time we have six image textures. So let's check that out. Okay, texture background, Kelp Forest Green. And here is the node getting edited. battery, that's a bad sign. Can, 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 you spare, can you spare yours for a little bit? Yeah. And uh, Jeff, why don't we cut it right at the friend disconnected. Thanks very much. Wow. Yes, with all of the uh, launching I've done that. 
So before you pick up on the uh, recording, Jeff, let's see if I can get it. Diagnose why didn't this watch my editor? Why well, don't we play it safe? And uh, since we're on a break, oh, a very short break, I'm just going to kill extra get it and watch it. Guys, I'm just about done with this. Can we go one more node? Fog. That's probably uh, 15 minutes. If you're going to need this uh, back in the next 15, 20 minutes, can I run down the hall and get mine? I'm good. Okay. I've got a good time. I just had a quick question. How they? Uh, yep. Yeah. When they're taking the pictures for the. 360 are they with that special lens or can you just take multiple pictures and pan? And uh, you know, I tried to find it. Some of the some of the original guys on the Vermal spec actually did a piece of software uh, to do that and uh, used to sell it and I couldn't find it anymore. Uh, I think it was called Sky Paint or something like that. But there are ways of warping an image to to make it work. And there's also some image techniques to line them up. Uh, so, uh, aren't you taking a class with Matthias this quarter? Yeah, we're, we're not in Image that. synthesis? Uh, oh, no, I'm not. No, what's, what's the name of Matthias' uh, computer, computer vision? vision? Yeah. yeah, that's a good question for Matthias. Okay. Hey, if I take four pictures, is there what software could I use to see them together? Yeah. Yeah. I suspect you, can, you might be able to do it in Photoshop, but I just don't know and I haven't really checked. So could you put that in the notes as a to-do, find out how we might uh, actually uh, build some of those? Because if there was an easy way to do it, uh, that I would add that as a project. Okay, so I think we're working this time. Okay, so here we are on the scene. Let's uh, open up these nodes. And we've got a texture background node. We'll edit that. And sure enough, we've got the same arrays for sky color and ground color. We can uh, add elements to this array. Uh, <coughs> we can remove them. In fact, uh, Chris, here's another uh, good bug here. When I added added elements to the sky angle array, it put them at the beginning where the zenith already was. That's a bad idea. Let's add them to the end. Okay. Now, given that that bug is there, could you get away? Is there a workaround? Sure. Just use the up and down arrow. But I think by default, when we do a, an add on the uh, angle, the sky values, the add should go to the bottom and not to the top. Okay, but that little quirk aside, it's certainly uh, workable and adjustable. We see it's a little simpler than the background node editor in that all we have to worry about is the sky angles because the URLs are no longer there. Instead, we have the six image textures. Just by direct inspection here, we can see the four, uh, excuse me, the six in this case, container field uh, values, and uh, there they are. And sure enough, front URL, back URL, left, right, top URL, bottom URL. Uh, oh, there's another quirk there, uh, uh, Chris. It looks like my bottom URL escaped. So let's fix that. And that must have been an unintended cut and paste error before. So I'm just going to copy that whole array from the top entry, paste it in, and then 
this is where sometimes it is much more helpful to have a text editor than a um, any kind of fancy editor. So on this last one, we want to simply change the word top to bottom in all the entries that appear on this line. So uh, let's do that. We'll take top, replace it with bottom, and we're still on line 26, which is good. So let's start replacing. I won't hit replace all because that would break the other ones. But instead, where it's blue there, it's getting replaced each time. This should be the last one on this line. Okay, uh, let's close that guy. Look back up at where it exists. Here it is, bottom URL. Later on that line, bottom. Okay, so we just fixed something. I'll save that. And today's date is the 17th. And we won't even mess around. I know that's uh, a good fix. So I'm going to check that into version control. So we are guaranteed that that is kept forever. Okay, if we drill down into one of those image textures that we confirm visually just in the editor, we can still go into the edit element under cursor. And here you see something that we really needed to use, but is there, and that is the uh, container field is in the interface. And uh, that's where we get the field name. So by simply checking that, makes it active, and then we can type in the value that we want. By default, an image texture has the value texture as its container field. When it's used inside a shape node, that's the value that's there. Since that default has always worked in the past, we've never had to touch it before. But here we're special purposing image texture inside the texture background node, and that's why we have that change. Okay, a bit of an advanced topic is uh, this notion of URNs. We'll skip that for another day. But the, the underlying idea on URNs is you could uh, define a generic address like this that would refer to a family of online URL addresses trying to duplicate the functionality that we already have in X3D. So URN is uh, not a specific to X3D thing, but, but actually an Internet Engineering Task Force standard. Uh, I believe it's implemented in XJ3D. They have a URN parser. But uh, in practice, it, in theory, it looks like a great idea. In practice, it's rarely used and, and not so often supported. So uh, look twice, look three times before you start jumping into URNs. Great idea if it works. Okay. And that's it for texture background. So now we're on the uh, final home stretch, and that's our last node in this chapter, the fog node. Okay. So uh, because it's ambiance, atmosphere type of thing. We do categorize fog node as one of the environmental effects. Don't use it all the time. Please don't. It's, uh, it's not as bad as the blink tag in HTML, but uh, if overdone, it can get uh, pretty onerous, pretty, pretty annoying. So, uh, but uh, occasionally and carefully used, it can be pretty good. So, uh, when might we most use it? Well, uh, white or gray fog is usually the kind of color that you would use if you want a foggy day. 
if you're trying to show that. If you want to do nighttime effects, then you'd set your fog color to black. Okay, because it means the farther things get away from you, the darker they get. Another important thing to do with nighttime effects is uh, you would probably also want to set your ambient intensity to zero so that there was no residual background ambient light uh, helping to illuminate anything in your scene. You probably also want to get rid of points, lines, and any emissive color. So it does take quite a bit of preparation to make a nighttime scene. But you can do it, and fog can help you do that if, if the lighting isn't dramatic enough for you on how dark things get. Okay, now how does it work? Well, uh, from a graphics perspective, it's pretty, pretty darn simple. Uh, the range between an object and the viewer's camera, where the viewing position is. The farther away it gets, the more the fog washes it out until all you get is the fog color. Your object's completely washed out. So um, uh, here's where that fails horribly. And that is, if you use a different background color than a different fog color, because fog does not affect background. And, and thus, you could be graying out or whiting out or blacking out objects with your fog color, but then they stand out as very crisp shadows, as silhouettes against your background. And that's not the point. Usually with fog, you want to make them disappear rather than get Highlighted. So, some experimentation is needed, and uh, I need to remember that fog has no effect on the background. Okay, that's why they must be set to the same color, so when the fog fades into the background color, and you don't get silhouettes, it just sort of disappears. Okay, what other fields do we have in fog? Well, we have a color field, that's good. It's a single RGB, there's no transparency value for fog. Transparency wouldn't make too much sense because the purpose of fog is to obscure things in the first place. Then we have uh, fog type which is a label, an enumeration type we sometimes call that. Uh, and fog type equals linear means that you have uh, a 1 over R relationship, inverse relationship between range and the drop-off. Exponential is uh, more gradual, more gradual drop-off. That's often a better match for how fog appears in the real world can also be more computationally expensive though because uh, it's harder on a pixel by pixel basis to do uh, exponential calculations as compared to a simple uh, linear relationship. But uh, what's the right answer? You should try. You should try different values and see how it works for you. And then visibility range is an even better control for how much fog is enough or where does it take effect. Because the visibility range is actually the distance where you say, okay, at, at that distance of visibility range, I am completely washed out. I won't see anything but fog past that, no partial coloring of the object in there. So uh, there you go. So is that 10 meters? Is that 50, 50 meters, 100 meters? Depends on the scene. Usually it's fairly close because if you're in the fog, it's often a pretty dramatic effect. Uh, as with other ranges, it does pay attention to the transformation hierarchy. So if you've got transforms above that, uh, be careful. Uh, if there's a scaling in there, that will change the scaling of the range. So you don't want to get that off. You want to keep it in meters, so it's predictable. Okay, so here's our example. 
Here's our fog node. You can see that uh, this was a pretty simple value. Uh, 0.8, 0.8, 0.8 is almost white, meaning gray. And the linear drop off and a 60 minute, excuse me, 60 meter uh, visibility range. So let's check this example out. Time to, uh, time to open it up, I guess. Okay, chapter 11. Here's the PNG value image of it. That was, uh, Looks like it's maybe uh, 20 or 30 meters away. Let's bring up the scene. And uh, by the way, this uh, piece of the kelp forest exhibit here that we're looking at is uh, a two-story tall piece of uh, architecture. So that's probably, uh, I don't know, you guys have been there, right? Would you say uh, 15 meters maybe, top to bottom? something like that. Almost you can look at the model. Uh, we built it to scale. So if you want to know the exact height, you can just check that. Uh -oh. And bad news, we've uh, got an error. Let's drop a new fog in and see if that helps. Okay, so here's what the uh, fog editor looks like. You see we've got our typical color array, color editor here. And we've got uh, either linear or exponential, and then we've got our visibility range. If visibility range is set to zero, then uh, it doesn't put a, a max on it. In fact, let's check the tooltip on that, see just what does it say. I guess I'm forgetting what the zero was. Oh yeah, that's right. It wouldn't make sense to have a range of zero because then you wouldn't know where to wash it out to. So rather than make that illegal, we gave it a different uh, meaning, which is no fog. Okay, so that could be helpful because if you're animating your fog value, and you wanted to uh, gradually increase it, then you could set up a scalar interpolator to go to this thing and just set it at zero values in the interpolator until you're ready to jump it up very high, meaning far away fog, and then gradually bring it closer so that the fog got stronger and stronger. That would be a good exercise, actually, to play with. Okay, so I think that summarizes fog. Uh, Chris, you got that uh, bug report that something broke in the uh, fog editor panel mm -hmm. on this. Could you please toss that in the notes? Sorry. I was able to drop in a new fog node. That worked okay, but it had some heartburn with the, the, uh, the terminology in software engineering for this is uh, side effect. Meaning we changed something in one place and uh, another thing broke somewhere else. So somehow we broke the fog editor. We'll fix it up again. All right, so our chapter summary. We've covered a lot of ground here uh, in lighting and uh, environment. Since these things are kind of sophisticated, you probably see why we uh, deferred these topics till later in the book. I think it's telling that we were able to build so many kinds of models, get so much done, uh, up until then, up until now, without using lighting and fog, but now that you have them, your uh, palette as an author is that much richer. Okay, so uh, we covered the four kinds of lights, the three that everybody knows about, namely uh, 
directional light, point light, and spotlight. But then the other one that uh, <coughs> is left off the list but is there all the time and in fact the most widely used one, that's the headlight on navigation info, which is itself a type of directional light. Okay, and then we looked at our two background nodes, background and texture background, which are extremely similar in structure, identical in functionality, and sharing a simple single binding stack. And then finally, good old fog, which has its most impact if you only use it occasionally. Something we'll cover uh, someday in the future, but not now, is uh, local fog. If you want to play in more specialized effects, then I recommend you look ahead at that. And the place to look would be in the spec, the X3D specification. Okay, so here are some uh, good exercises. Uh, touch sensor to turn things on or off. Um, uh, in this case, a light on or off. And don't forget that the uh, um, that's the value is on equals true or on equals false. Then uh, you would want to toggle so that each time you're clicking or letting go, the light isn't just flipping back and forth, but use the toggle mode in, in between to save that state until you come back and click it again. Uh, another good exercise is, uh, just as we did in the additive subtractive light example, put a little globe around the light or perhaps a little cone if it's a spotlight. And if you give that emissive color so it's glowing, that helps give the impression that, oh yes, this is a light, it's uh, emitting things here. Um, and if you put transparency, that also helps it look kind of virtual, and look more like energy. Okay, uh, fiddle around with background and texture background and uh, look at fog. So plenty of uh, things to do. Our references, we have uh, the regular ones. This was uh, chapter 11 in the book. Uh, our scene authoring hints and graphic stuff are always there. The verbal source book has uh, many chapters, most of them smaller, so here we have chapters on each of these, lighting, background, and fog. Then uh, uh, lighting effects, if you want to learn more about them, this is a, a great book. Uh, focuses primarily on materials, but the appearance of these things is highly dependent on light, so there's some uh, in-depth chapters there in advanced lighting techniques. And then uh, here's a nice website that if you're curious about that additive subtractive color issue, which again is not strictly X3D, it's just some other advanced technique. This is a good place to learn more about that. And so we are all done with uh, lighting and environment. That completes chapter 11. We're getting there. Almost done. See you next time.